So, um, as Salar explained, I'm with the EBU, which is uh, the world's uh, foremost association of public broadcasters. We have members in 73 uh, members in 56 countries, as you can see in the slides, um, with the potential uh, uh, reach of uh, a billion people all over the world. Um, one of the things that we are doing within the EBU is to support our members, public broadcasters from all over Europe and beyond, to reach and connect with their audiences more efficiently. So, of course, virtual reality is one of the trends. It's one of the latest developments within broadcasters. We're still experimenting, exploring what is, in, what is it in there for us to uh, create better experiences for the audience. Um, it's still definitely a very, very, very initial phase. They're still testing, uh, we're still trying to figure out what we should do, how, um, how much we should invest, whether we should invest or not. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, some of the answers, because we've been talking to some of our members, some of the broadcasters, why are you guys investing at the moment in virtual reality? Some answers are like quite obvious, but these are the, f the three main answers that we would group for, for them to explain why they're investing in virtual reality. One is, of course, we have more opportunities to tell our stories, almost endless opportunities with virtual reality. Another answer is, it is part of the public broadcasting remit to, if there is a new medium, new medium out there, to explore how it can help us to connect with the audience better, to create better experiences with them. It's part of our role in society. And another answer is the potential of the medium is clear, but there are still so many unanswered questions that unless we actually invest in exploring it further, we won't uh, figure out what exactly the audience wants from us. So I've got, it's about testing in order to gather more and more audience insights and to understand what really the audience wants from us. Why they are not investing in virtual reality? Because some are not yet investing in virtual reality and some are investing, but only very little. Why? These are the main reasons that they have been giving us. Lack of skills, lack of, lack of tools, lack of vision. There aren't established work, uh, workflows yet. The quality is not good enough for us to go on public. We're still testing, but we don't really dare to go on mainstream with our virtual reality content. The market is very dynamic and changes very, very fast. The return on investment is still unclear. And as you know, in public broadcasters, it is very important for us to justify very transparently what we're using our funds and, and, and our budget for. The, 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 the society's uh, contribution to what we're doing needs to be very clear. So is it clear that they want us to uh, invest in virtual reality or not? And then distribution seems to be a very clear challenge as well. So some of the conclusions that we've uh, got to is that the potential of virtual reality for broadcasters is very clear, but there are so many unanswered questions yet. Some of them, hopefully, we're going to try to answer today with you. And the second conclusion is that uh, it's not about whether we should invest in virtual reality or not at the moment. It is clear that the potential is there, but how much of our budget and of our energy and of our skills should we, put in, should, should we be putting into virtual reality? Another of the questions that hopefully we will be discussing today. So I'm delighted to have such a great panel with me, with uh, colleagues from Wiley Feinstein and Nancy Komulainen, Will Saunders from the BBC, Eva Lopez from Deutsche Welle, and Dominique Born from SRF here in Switzerland. Um, guys, tell us. First of all, some of our questions. Why would you think we should be investing in virtual reality as public broadcasters, or why not, or how much? Let's start. Ansi, how much is Wiley in Finland investing in it? Um, at the moment, we don't have a fixed number, but um, the way we operate is that, that we're not in a production stage yet. So, so um, at the moment, we are mostly experimenting with things with small numbers, so basically from 10,000 to 20,000 euros is, a, is something that we, could, we are willing to put in a project just to find out how the medium works and uh, how to tell stories with the medium. But, but our, our aim at the moment is more to learn the medium and, and be ready once the headsets are rolling in and people are, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a public demand for the content so that we can switch into production mode and then of course the budget will be bigger. Mm -hmm. But in percentages, how much are you investing? You know, how much is it a little bit of your budget that you actually want to try with virtual reality? Or is it actually, you know, what now my innovation efforts are going to go into virtual reality at the moment? Well, um, of course, the, the, the annual budget of the company is 500 million. So obviously, a couple of thousand or 10,000 or 100,000 a year is, is going to be, a, it's not going to be a, even 100,000 a year. So it's, it's, it's tiny. So basically, in the mode, 
where we're playing the kind of money that we can, we can afford to lose. But on the other hand, we feel that we need to be part of the game because you can win big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is it in the BBC, Will? Um, I think the BBC, like a lot of public broadcasters, is in a, in a uniquely privileged position. You're talking about something that is effectively creative risk capital. So this is something that I think is, is fascinating. Uh, I, I think it comes to something that, you know, publicly funded broadcasters also have to think about being culturally specific in the content that they make because they're publicly funded. Um, and I think what's fascinating about this world, and I don't think virtual reality sits on its own, I think virtual reality sits within a landscape of immersive experiences. So it sits within the world of uh, augmented reality, immersive uh, experiences like mixed reality, and I think virtual reality is just, you know, it's, it's the one that on the hype curve, which we'll show, is just kind of closest to mainstream adoption, and that isn't going to happen anytime soon either. So um, I think what's interesting is, if your business is story, right, and there are so many people whose business is story. Newspapers now have to be in the business of story because news, they get beaten to every day on social platforms. Theatres, art galleries. If you're in the business of story, then this world is fascinating. And the reason it's so fascinating is because the last two or three years, it's all been about technology and hardware. And that period's coming to an end, and we're going to start talking about content very soon. We're starting to have content now. We just don't see enough content pipelines and not enough fully funded content pipelines. That's what we need to grow this sector. Mm -hmm. Dominic, what is holding SRF back to invest even more in this medium? Well, we invest a lot into uh, 360 degrees videos already because we, we have some, uh, let's say, we know a little bit how, how to produce some of the videos. So that's why we uh, started mm, to produce every month one, one video in 360 degrees. But it's, it's not really that we directly jump into a VR experience or something else. So we, we, there we need to spend a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also that, that, that we try to learn, I think it's the same for all of us, how to uh, work with this and how to tell a story in 360 degrees or, or in a VR or in a immersive. So it, it, it's really at the start. So it's, it, for me, it's a little bit like the, the, the GoPro where the GoPro started, everyone uh, does these little tiny camera shootings, which, blah, 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 mm -hmm. but no one knows why they do it. And, and uh, also we, as a public broadcaster, starts to work with GoPros. Mm -hmm. And now we know it's not the shake, it, 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 it's the story, what you can produce with a, with a GoPro. So that's why we need also to start to think about VR, 360, AR and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what about Deutsche Welle, Eva? You work in Deutsche Welle Innovation. How much of your innovation efforts are going specifically into virtual reality at the moment? Um, at the moment, we are very lucky because we got a project funded by Google, DNI. So there are two people, my colleagues Alexander Plaum and myself, who are working on a VR or 360 dedicated project. And um, that's actually a good way in Deutsche Welle to do something with 360 and VR. Because if not, most of our most of the attention goes to social media at the moment. And VR 360 is something that people are enthusiastic about, but it's not really a lot of money going in mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's uh, go into details about that a bit a bit earlier, but one of the, later. But one of the things that Ansi said was actually that in Wiley, uh, it's still a very experimental phase. I think it's the case for most of us, at least in public broadcasting. Um, you guys are still experimenting. You have not really used the content for mainstream. How is it? What you guys are doing at the moment? What is it? Can you show us? Sure. So, um, so I, I, I run a, a um, incubator for the company. So it's called Wiley Beta. And the, the, the purpose of this incubator is that, that we realize that the, the whole industry is in a big change. And we understand that there's going to be a big wave that is going to either crush us or we have to learn, learn ways to, to surf that wave. And, and the, the problem, I think, is that we don't really know where the big wave is coming. But um, we are believing that, that VR, AR, mixed reality, are all things that might have something to do with the big wave. And in order to surf the wave, you have to like, learn how to surf. And that's what we're doing at the moment. And so um, our Wiley Beta is an incubator beta for future media experiences. And what we do at the moment is, is we're looking for, for wild ideas to, to ex understand the potential of different new technologies and starting trends. And we had just started, but I have a couple of clips of what we've been doing so far. Um, yes. 
So here, um, this one is about immersive journalism. We, we found a really promising um, VR startup from Finland, and we paired them with, with some of our journalists uh, with the aim of finding new ways to tell stories in uh, VR for, for conflict journalism and, and places where you can't go as a, as a normal person. And what they did, um, they went to the center of Helsinki, they found some 3D maps of Helsinki, and they shot some picture and, and made, made a 3D, 3D scene of, of the, the center square. And, um, and after that, they, they duplicated the same process, but, but replaced the, the, the scenes with, with some live footage from Aleppo, Syria. And the, the purpose of this, this experimentation was to understand and give people an opportunity to, to really feel what it would feel like to, to live in Syria and if the war would be on their doorsteps. A lot of the, the experimentation, experimentation was dealing also about, about audio and how to guide people's attention there with different like rocket fire and also you, you saw a mobile phone there, so basically the mobile phone is is where the narration comes from and the, sto the, the story is being told to you as a, as a news broadcast. And we learned a lot by, by doing this. Um, the exper experiment is about three minutes long. It's, it's uh, made for, for HTC Vive and you can download it from our website. It's a free one. And the next thing we tried uh, was volumetric... Uh, oh, sorry, this one. So volumetric capturing. Um, that is obviously a very, something very interesting in the VR space at the moment. And uh, we found a team who's able to do volumetric capturing with, with um, Xbox Kinect. So instead of putting, putting hundreds of thousands in the, in the hardware, they're put, putting thousands of, or, some, or some hundreds. And uh, what they were lacking was, was a professional space to do their, their, their pilots in. So what we did, we, we offered them some time in our studios and, and helped them set up their gear there. And we did some experimentation on how to do live 3D footage. Um, and this is a, a clip I got two days ago. So what they did, uh, this is, th these are uh, people that have been shot in our studios and all separately and put in the same picture. And, um, and once again, they haven't put the texture there yet, there yet but, but what they did, they, they also shot some, some uh, RGB picture, like normal video picture that you can then put on top of that and make a texture. So we're hoping that within a couple of weeks we will have a complete experiment where you can walk into and have sort of like a really close one, uh, close look at, at, at a real 3D picture. It's a, it's a, it's a music video for, for a band that they also belong to. For your love and blood to feed the flame Kinects all in different directions, and they were able to capture the whole person. But of course, it's still kind of like flashing a little bit. So the technology is not there yet. But this will give us an opportunity to try out. You know, once the technology is ready, what do we do with it? And the third clip that I brought um, is just a combination of uh, different audio experimentations that we've been doing. Um, one of the assets that we realized that we have is we have a hundred piece. Uh, symphony orchestra and we have a concert house so we're figuring that okay well we'll find someone who can make use of that so we, we partnered with one hardware company uh, okay do I have to click it no and um, we were running some 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 test in our in our concert house and and let that company uh, try try different ways of, of making spatial audio with our band and our venue and these are just some of the clips that they were doing there this is not only but obviously you can't hear it because it's to the, uh, to, to the, the uh, sound, but um, we're really, really hoping to, to learn a lot from that and tell, tell stories in the audio space. So at the moment we are looking for partners for new kind of experimentations. We're willing to to put in our, our assets or our resources and open them as a platform for for testing things and learning things together. And for us, that's that's what incubation is all about. And you're welcome to just contact me and, and come up with an idea, and we'll make it true. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ansi. So, what do you think is missing for these experimentations to become mainstream one day? 
Well, at the moment, uh, if you look at the what we've been doing, of course, the, the quality isn't there yet, so we can't broadcast stuff like this. Pe these people will be quite surprised that, that we're using their tax money into producing something like that. And on the other hand, the headsets are not there or the audience is not there, so basically access to these things has to be in on place and there has to be a public demand for us to do it. But as soon as we have those in place, we'll, we'll start producing stuff and, and adding some, some resources to do it properly. And how is the audience reacting to these first pilots? Of course, everybody's really happy and excited about it, but, but it's, it's a very narrow set of people who have been seeing and, exp and experimenting it with it and experiencing it. So I think the large public hasn't really, really realized that we're doing this yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Actually, the BBC has, do has been doing quite a lot uh, in terms of trying to understand audience reactions to the virtual reality experimentation, right, with BBC Taster. Will, how is it going? Yeah, OK. I'll, I'll sit down. Sorry. Um, OK. So. Um, my background is, I, uh, I think I sh said at the beginning, right? I, was, I was a comedy producer for quite a long time. I'm, I come from the world of editorial content, TV, radio, and then got into digital media about seven, eight years ago. Um, and uh, I now work with BBC Studios, and that's a £350 million TV business. And it makes everything from Strictly Come Dancing to War and Peace to all the big natural history shows, right? Um, but if you want to know where content is going, it isn't necessarily, you know, the platform of television is the thing that is starting to fall away. The content you put on television is, is as live now as it ever has been. But if you want to know where audiences are going, you need to be able to create, create an environment in which you can safely test new ideas. So a year and a half ago, we launched this platform, which is an audience-facing kind of Kickstarter program, where we put half-finished ideas new technologies uh, we license, and most importantly for this event, we put all our VR work, as best we can, into a space where we can get audiences to test it. And um, the, the, if you Google this or go online, this is an audience facing, most of the content's global, and it's really important we understand how audiences respond to new technologies and new formats, because only then will we understand what we can scale. Um, it's a website, it's, it's a label, because it doesn't just appear on bbc.co.uk, we use this on social platforms, we use this in uh, app stores, we use this in VR stores. And as I say, it's all about data and analytics we get off the audience. Um, in terms of what we've been doing with it, obviously, <laughs> this is really important, we understand where we are, right? The, the Gartner's hype cycle, we understand where we are in this landscape. Uh, virtual reality as we, as we understand it, we're on the slope of enlightenment right now, uh, and we play in that space where uh, Taster does most of the things from innovation trigger all the way through. But in terms of the work that VR is making possible for us, um, we've played with it in lots of different scenarios, right? We've put it in our TV shows, we've put it in The Voice, uh, we've put it in, uh, most interestingly, um, so David Attenborough, the patron saint of natural history television, he's 91 years old. He's the person who's pushed new technology adoption within story hardest than anyone else, right? Um, he works with lots of people. His uh, last film, VR thing, which he did with a company called Atlantic, won a BAFTA Digital Creativity Award a few weeks ago. Uh, so David Attenborough has always sat at the heart of what's coming next. He's fascinated by this landscape, all right? He's an engine for change at 91. Let that be a lesson to all of us, right? Um, we've put it around our high-end IP. We don't think this world will mean much if we don't adapt it to what we're already doing. So we make huge amounts of high-end factual and scripted content. We can take some of our big TV shows, History of Rome, shots uh, for BBC One, massively high-rendered title sequences that we can take, re-render, and use within a VR landscape. So we can have event programming that resonates on every platform. So uh, we turn that into a VR experience. Um, we can also do things with teams who are used to creating content, best-in-class content in certain ways. We have one of the largest and most accomplished live outside broadcast teams. We gave them the capability to shoot 360 video in lots of different ways. Uh, we have Trooping the Colour, which is the, the uh, ceremony where we, we celebrate the Queen's birthday. Uh, she has two. Uh, and uh, 
We put 360 rig exactly where the Queen would be standing one week before the live event because, you know, we rehearsed these things a week before they happen. And we gave audiences the Queen's perspective on Trooping the Colour, published that through social feeds, and that did pretty well in terms of numbers. But what it did for the team who shoot live television OBs, it made them understand what this landscape could do for them. Um, and we're also creating um, high game engine driven virtual, inter virtual reality interactive stuff for HTC's Vive, lots of different platforms. Uh, and this was a project we did based on Tim Peake's spacewalk. Uh, Tim Peake blasted into space. We've made loads of television, but we also created the interactive spacewalk based on training he had had at NASA. This is now an offline experience at the Science Museum. It's really important when we work in this space, we understand the cycle of audience expectation and what you can do, whether or not you can create high-rendered virtual game engine experiences that nobody's going to see right now, really. The reality is these are very, very high-end experiences. Massively important we're doing them, but from an audience consumption point of view, they're not going to be mass, right? But what you can do is you can scale that all the way back to a 360 social video experiment, which lots of people can see. So at the moment, we're trying lots of different things in lots of different spaces. But most importantly, we're trying to understand what audiences get from this and where we think it will apply to our storytelling going forward. And what have been the main lessons so far? What would you say? Uh, the main lessons so far are in the need to have the very best storytellers in your business playing in this space. You cannot have um, a difference between story from platform to platform. If you don't have the best people who make all your best natural history television making this stuff and you see a difference in quality between what you're watching on one platform and another platform, the audience will feel cheated. The audience will know that this is just hype because the quality isn't there. And that's the, that's the real thing I think we have to get right, which is we have to get the story right because yeah. that technology is just fantastic. What we're lacking right now is really brilliant story-led content. Mm -hmm. So you would say that you, we don't really necessarily need to get taken by the, because technology is indeed so much so good at the moment that sometimes we, we could actually say, okay, we have to be at that level, we have to be at that rhythm, produce stories just to fit on technology. You are sort of saying that it's quite the other way around. We should first focus on the content and then choose the best technology for it. Yeah, it's never ever about technology. It's only ever about story. Story and talent are what drive experiences and audience reaction to story. That's true, true for game, it's true for cinema, it's true for everything. Technology is the driver for the story and we, we have to have the best storytellers playing with the most exciting technologies. Mm -hmm. If we don't get that, we lose the risk of not being able to make this stuff mainstream. Mm -hmm. And based on the audience reactions that you've gathered so far, would you say that there is potential for virtual reality to become mainstream one day? It's it, the, the, the mainstream, what will make VR mainstream sits outside our gift. That will sit inside the gift of uh, Right now, we all know we're playing within gated communities. We're playing on platforms that we don't necessarily uh, own or run, right? That's the, that's the reality of a, a world gone global in content. Mm -hmm. But I think, in, as we say, in the landscape of public service broadcasting, once you can scale, once you understand that things have value to audiences, you can start to claim some of that back. Whether VR will go mainstream, I have my doubts. Immersive content definitely will go mainstream. Mm -hmm. Augmented reality will be a huge thing in the next two years. Whether or not VR goes mainstream, I don't know. But not everything has to go mainstream in order to have impact and to have value. Mm -hmm. Are there any other thoughts from the other panelists? How do you see, do you see virtual reality come, becoming mainstream one day? Well, I don't know if this is the right, right place to say it loud, but I, yes, I think if I could say it from my uh, point of view. If I get uh, from a friend a video which is VR and he says to me, you need to, to, to wear gloves or whatever, I forget it normally until two, two hours later because I don't have it, so I cannot use it directly. So that's why the, the VR thing is for me the technology gap or, or to have it directly 
I, I, I should have it directly on the glass if I'm wearing a glass like ANSI has, and I could switch directly on VR and then I have it, then I, yes, then it's mainstream. But if I realize that I need to go home, need to switch on my super duper computer to, to use it, then perhaps the gap is too, it's too, yeah, it's too big. Virtual reality doesn't need to go mainstream to succeed. There's a business-to-business -business market and there's a business-to-consumer market. At the moment, I'm working uh, for the government around uh, work to do with the cultural sector and digital technology. Uh, and I think there's a massive growth area in business-to-business -business right now. And business-to-business -business around VR and the gaming sector will drive so much change so, so quickly for the rest of us. And I think that idea of uh, it all having to go in, that, in the landscape of B2C is, is just not there. I, th I think the B2B market will drive this uh, very, very quickly uh, and we'll all learn a great deal because we are still, um, you know, we're still in the hype curve, right? We're not, we're not at mainstream adoption, but we're on the way there. And, and for those of us who have limited budgets, we've got to work out wh where we put those bets, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even if, if you have the, po um, you need to think as a, as a public broadcaster, there is always, uh, you need to, to do the math um, the money that I spend is for the public, so if, if there is no public, the people will, will, will give you the receipt and say, hey, you do some niche program, but not with the niche money, so you do it with the public money. So it's always, you need to decide, shall I directly run into and, and, and run into problems, yeah. or, or, or shall, I, shall I mark it as a test? Yeah. Because business to business, absolutely, I'm, I'm absolutely with, with you, but it, it, it's also that we, we, we need a, yeah, we need the consumers as well yeah. as a public broadcaster. Yeah. It's tricky, but it's not just a question about the budget. We also said that one of the reasons why public broadcasters are not necessarily investing even more in virtual reality is that there are not enough tools for content creators to produce easily and in a flexible way content for 360 and virtual reality. Deutsche Welle has a tool actually for journalists. Eva, will you tell us about it? Um, can I have the clicker? Oh, yeah. Going backwards. That's it. Okay, perfect. So, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, I was asked to, to give insights about what Deutsche Welle is thinking and doing currently in terms of 360. And um, so, the good thing is, the good news is, when I talk to the journalists, when I talk to the technical people and developers in our house, everyone, almost everyone, is uh, almost enthusiastic about the technology. So, the interest is there, and that's a good ground for us to work and uh, do research further on it. Um, there are two, two things that I would like to share with you. First, sorry. Um, first of all, currently Deutsche Welle is having one YouTube 360 format that I'm going to introduce, and then we're working on this uh, fader development tool that I would, spend, would like to spend most of my time to, to go through it. Uh, let's start with the YouTube format. This is an, not a surprise that the Deutsche Welle Travel Magazine is actually using 360. They have a format that uh, allows the, the viewer, the user, to very quickly get to know a location. So there's a presenter, it's a woman called um, Elizabeth York, who goes who guides the user through those experiments. And she does it in a very careful way. So she gives some background information, but she also, and it's very important, gives the time for the users to just watch around and uh, discover the location where they are for themselves. So one might think that this is a very basic 360 uh, format, and actually it is. But, and that's a, that's a lesson that we learned, it is still very powerful and successful, so it's well received and something that kept us thinking. So you don't need to have this highlight VR product maybe um, to enter the world of VR in 360. You can just start with the basics. And this is why we now work on a tool that's called Fader. Um, to, to put it in, in two, three sentences. Um, we, want, um, we, have to, we want to tackle two things. So first of all, we want to make 
VR and 360, especially 360, uh, familiar, uh, attractive for our audience, so make them familiar with the technology step by step. And that's the second lesson that we learned. I said at the beginning that people in our house are very enthusiastic about the technology, but still there's just this one format out there. So we want to lower the barrier for the journalists to actually start working with 360, uh, 360 videos. And it's not about having the high-end product, it's just about having very good stories told in a good way and uh, make that as pragmatic as possible. So this is how FEDA looks like. Um, just to make it short, FEDA is a collaborative 360 storytelling tool. So it sounds very buzzwordy, but actually it describes what it, what it is. It's a tool that allows you and the team to work on a 360 story. Uh, to give you some context, FEDA was and is developed by a Berlin startup called Fragments. And together with Fragments, Euronews and Deutsche Welle, we are in a consortium in a project and we're trying to approve FEDA in a way that it suits the, requirement, the journalistic requirements. And to do so, we have two main goals. And the first goal is what I already mentioned, is to make it very pragmatic. So everyone likes special effects, but we don't need special effects. And FEDA is very effective the way it is because you can do you as a journalist, you, can, you are able to create a 360 story without being a pro in, uh, I don't know, Adobe Premiere. You don't need to have this skill set necessarily. And the second thing that we are very keen about is, um, is about publishing. We, don't, we really want to lower the barriers so that journalists can publish it right away the story. So at the moment, you can either share it online on Twitter or Facebook very easily, the story, or you can embed it in your content management system via iframe, what is, um, what is very nice and works well. Let's have a look at the workspace of FEDA. Let's imagine you're a journalist, you have your story in your head, you have the footage, 360 video, 360 uh, images, but now you want to build a story. So what do you do? You just upload your footage to the FEDA work environment and you put the story, the scenes, step by step, one after another, in the way that it, it's according to your storyline. So from the beginning, beginning till the end, you can build everything there in this work environment. The good thing is while you do so, you can add text, you can add audio, you can text, you can add images. And it's very, very, it's very easy to do so. It's really not so complicated. Um, you can tell a linear story, so from the beginning till the end, like a YouTube video, or you can do, create a non-linear story. So you can add interactives that the viewer can decide which way he or she wants to go. When, uh, once you are ready, you just click on publish on the right hand side, you do two clicks and then it's published, it's out there, and you can share it. Um, when we test it, it takes us more or less one hour to produce a story, a solid good story, which is what we find very convincing and what motivates us to work further on this product. And also if you, in the audience, if you would like to test this tool, just uh, feel free to approach me after the panel or sign up. Keep in mind it's still a prototype, so it's not all, all functional perfectly, but it's, uh, it's solid and it works and we are happy for every feedback that we receive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evan. What are the skills that you think someone would need to actually create a story with Fader? A good story with Fader. Could you repeat the question? What skills do you think one needs? Um, I think actually you just need to be open about new technologies. And if you are experiment, experienced already with apps, mobile apps, or uh, um, tools like PageFlow, then it will be very easy for you to work on that. It's mm -hmm. really not so hard. You don't need to think like an editor. You just need, you, you need to think like a journalist. What do I want to tell first? What second? What is the core of my story? And that's basically it. Of course, you need to have some knowledge about the technology. Mm -hmm. Like uh, don't make, don't confuse the audience by having too much movements in the 360 environment, but these are learnings mm -hmm. that uh, you will get quite quite mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Dominic, what tools are you guys using in SRF and what products have you launched? Ah, um, tools, we, we really work, thank you, we really work like the most of it uh, with, with a lot of GoPros and, and, and then we cut it down on, on the Adobe Premiere. So I think that's the normal one. So I hopefully get this right. 
Yes, there we are. So we, we started four years ago with 360 degrees videos and it was for us was a little bit um, because we saw a photographer from Australia, I think, and he did something with a wood in the middle and four cameras around it. And then we said, okay, let's do it on, on the Lauberhorn race. So it's a ski race downhill. And um, we absolutely know that this is not possible because the FIS, uh, the Federation of International Skiing or what something else, they will not allow us to go to the Lauberhorn with a, a wood on, on, on a helmet. And so that's why um, we bought uh, a, a rig and started to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to produce a classical 360 degrees video and this one which which I want to show to you is uh, last year is the Scotthart tunnel perhaps you heard of it it's the largest or the longest uh, train tunnel uh, in the world I think but it's um, and we were very proud because Switzerland as you know it's very small so that's why if we build something big then we are absolutely wow so we need to produce something special for it. And so that's why we said, okay, um, let's produce a, a, a video about the tunnel, which is absolutely stupid because in a tunnel you don't see anything, it's, it's black. So that's why we realized, okay, we need to do something special. And uh, I wanna show a little trailer uh, where you see what we did. And perhaps you can see that um, we also build not only uh, in the front of the locomotives, but we created also an air torpedo. And also some extra lights into the tunnel. So we had a deal with a, with a train company that we can run through the whole tunnel, do some uh, 360 degrees photos and then create uh, seven and a half minutes video and this one is the air torpedo because it was the time that you have the, have the possibility to um, erase uh, a helicopter or something else directly from the video so that's why we invited this um, air torpedo which is hanging uh, below a helicopter and uh, we cannot work with um, with a drone because it's 57 kilometers and it's not possible possible to uh, capture with a drone. So that's why we used the helicopter. And we are boys, so we, we, we said, okay, let's do it with a helicopter then instead of a, a drone. So, and um, what, what quite nice was that um, we had a lot of people watched it and um, also other uh, guys from Holland, uh, there are some guys which uh, loved it from Germany, even Al Jazeera, Balkanik wrote about it and, and, and put it on it. And it was really, it was seven and a half minutes and we have um, all together, um, close to half a million people watched this video and it was really only the tunnel. And it was, yeah, perhaps it's still online, it's still on YouTube, so you can go and, and watch it. And um, I would give you some uh, thing that we learned about this production, some learnings, is that uh, we absolutely forgot the original sound. This was absolutely stupid because we forgot how a, a tunnel sounds. Because a tunnel, normally you say, okay, that there is no sound, but there is some sound in a tunnel. So that's why next time we will do some original recordings. What we did was uh, iterative pro uh, post-production. So we produced the whole video, show it to 300 people, produced it again, show it again, and produced it again. So three circles in production. Then um, what we realized is that a lot of people don't move. They, they hold the, uh, the smartphone or even on, on, on the browser, they, they, they watch it, but they don't realize that, that they can move. So, so the, the story should, uh, should work without moving. It's absolutely stupid, I know, but it, it should, because then you will get the, uh, the bad thumbs, because this, uh, the people say, okay, it's, it's a crappy story, because you, you play a lot with the moving and not really with the story. So it should work without the moving. And sound is 70%, so that's why we work together with the guys from the radio. So we produced a radio journalist to produce the sound for a TV production, because the radio guys, they, 
they they are not focused on the on on the movie because they uh, uh, they talk about the topic and not on the focus on on, on what you want to show because there is no focus. You could watch in this direction or in this or in this, but the narration needs to uh, uh, to keep the story, and um, it should make sense. So, not uh, a story is not better if you use it with VR. So it should make sense. So it needs to be a very special place. And normally, you you are not going into the tunnel only if there is an emergency. Normally, you go through in 20 minutes. Wash. That's it. That's a tunnel. But uh, this experience, you only get in an emergency, and then you will not look around and say, "Whoa, what kind of concrete is this?" You will run out. So that's why. Uh, it, it, it should make sense to create a 360 degrees radio. And what we also find out is that uh, 360 degrees recording also useful for the TV guys because we produce it in a 4K so they could use it for the HD TV reports as well. And um, uh, the moving information should be in the opener logo so that the people realize that uh, there is something to move because we had some, some uh, uh, comments from, from the public which they say, okay, I only see the track, it's stupid. And we say, oh yeah, you, move, you need to move. Oh yes, all oh, right. So this is perhaps you, you should do into the logo. So I think that's it, yes. Thank you very much, Dominique. And just to try to wrap up, Please tell me, each of you, in 10 seconds, one thing that you think is the next step for your corresponding organization in terms of exploring with virtual reality. Augmented reality. Yes. Ansi? Uh, mixed reality for us. So we have a couple of pro uh, projects that we are looking at at the moment, but, but let's see if there's going to be co-founders and co-producers as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Eva, what's next? So we, <clears throat> we stay with 360, but we're going to use it for the coverage of the federal elections in Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Will. Better content. Mm -hmm. Once again, whatever that means, right? No, what, what, what that means, I think, is um, you're starting to see interesting companies emerge into the market. What, one we've seen, we have a, a, quite a vibrant VR uh, scene now, especially in London. Uh, and I've seen a company recently jump from the world of high-end factual storytelling into the world of virtual reality. I've seen another company jump uh, who make high-end uh, natural history television with Sir David Attenborough jumping into this landscape. We need more of that. Mm -hmm. We need more people who know how to tell stories jumping into this landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to the audience. Thank you very much to the panelists. And thank you very much to the World VR Forum for having us. Thank you. Thank you.